Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. To everybody, a quick bit of legalese that we always like to say up front. The information contained in this report is intended for educational purposes only. BlackBerry does not guarantee or take responsibility for the accuracy, completeness, and reliability of any third-party statements for research reference herein. So we're going to have some fun today. We're going to talk about some pretty deep dive esoteric things. Hello and welcome to BlackBerry's Decade of the Rats. This is a live webinar discussion of the latest report from BlackBerry's threat research team. We're just taking a look at a cross-platform APT espionage attacks that have targeted Linux, Windows, and Android. In the report, BlackBerry researchers examined the activities of five related adversarial groups who spent the better part of the last decade successfully targeting organizations in cross-platform attacks while operating relatively, if not entirely undetected, in a lot of different types of strategic and economic espionage operations. The report details how threat actor groups turned their attention to Linux, Android, and Windows, and it also provides some threat intelligence assessments of the strategic and tactical use of novel, novel malware and attack attack techniques employed by several different threat actors. So the conclusions that we have drawn represent the best judgments of the researchers based on data and all of the stuff that they examine. With that being said, I would like to welcome Kevin Lavelli, the Director of Threat Intelligence, and Sarah Lofgren, the Director of Channel Engineering. Kevin and Sarah, how are you doing? Thank you. Great. Good morning. So let's dig in here. Kevin, you have been absolutely nose to the grindstone, shoulder to the wheel in this for quite some time. Look, tell us about the report. What's in it? What's new? What matters? This is kind of your baby. Yeah. So what I hope we're going to do today is to talk about the new discoveries that we've made in attacks that are targeting Linux, Android, and Windows. We're not going to go into tremendous technical depth on it, but we're just going to sort of scratch the surface, give you an idea of what is new and interesting in this report, highlight some of the most more intriguing and interesting discoveries, and then talk about why it matters and have a little discussion about that. Following that, I think we're going to talk a little bit about the attackers and the targets, because that's typically a frequently asked question. Not going to spend too much time there, but again, just introduce these ideas. And then what I hope we do at the end here is talk about how you can use this report, both practically, if you're a network defender, strategically, if you're an exec, and, you know, sort of at the more about the security community level in terms of checking your assumptions and learning how to move forward based on what we've already discovered here. So that's where we're going. That's the roadmap. So right with you guys, we should, why don't we just dive in? Yeah, Matt? Yeah. And Sarah, we, well, Kevin was deeply involved in the research in this, so we're going to be looking at you for color commentary. As someone who leads a team of engineers, you are in the field much more than in the lab. So uh, looking to hear if what you've run into from your experience with this, maybe some suggested best practices, that sort of thing. So we got a, different perspectives as we are coming at this. Does that work? Yeah, absolutely. Well, all right. Let's, hey, how about if we start at the start, because that's always kind of the fun thing in this sorts of things. First off, with Linux, like, why is it unique that these folks were going after Linux first? Well, Linux malware is not unheard of. It's been around as long as Linux has been around, probably. And Linux malware in the hands of APT groups, and, and, and that's what we're talking about here for the uninitiated APT stands for Advanced Persistent Threat. And it's a rather cumbersome way of referring to threat actors who, who tend to act in a well-resourced, long-term, persistent fashion, typically indicating the backing of some government or, or acting in the interest of a government. So there is APT malware in the hands of uh, uh, targeting Linux out there, but very rarely do we see this much of it. That's the first interesting thing to point out is that we found pretty much a full stack of Linux malware that had been used for the most part in undetected for the better part of the last 10 years. So what's in the toolbox? On your screen, you'll see a list. We go into great detail in this report describing how we found it and how it all connects up. But we found an interactive installer script. So this was something that the attackers would place first on a Linux server. 
they would interact with it. It had like a command line interface and they would basically use this installer script to figure out what the target system was running, which distribution of Linux was running and which kernel version of Linux would, was running. And then they would, this installer script would call out to one of two build groups to make the malware that was then going to come and attack that server. One of those build groups was online and the other one was local on the target. For instance, you'd install this script and then it would say, okay, I'm running Red Hat Enterprise kernel version three. And then the installer script would reach out to that online build server and deliver malware that was specifically tailored for that Red Hat Enterprise kernel version three setup. And so what the installer script would deliver back from the build group would be a backdoor and a rootkit. What's interesting to note about these is that they work together. They were designed to work together at the kernel level. If you're familiar with Linux operating system, you'll recognize these as LKM rootkits is sort of the, the way in which it's referred to. These are running basically at ring zero on the kernel side, which is important because it's not visible to the user. And the rootkit and the, and the backdoor are working together to hide themselves. So they're hiding all network connections, they're hiding all processes, they're hiding any indication that you would typically look for if you're a network defender or a forensic investigator going after it to see whether or not there's malware on the system. And then finally, we found an attacker control panel. So this was like a graphic user interface, a little window that would pop up that where the attacker would be able to manage the attack remotely right? And basically manage the command and control aspect of the intrusion. So figure out which server they're on, when they're going to exfiltrate data from this, et cetera. And a particular note for us was that the control panel was capable of managing both Windows and Linux malware simultaneously. And we'll come to the Windows part of it later. So that was new. You generally don't see all these pieces, right? Together, in order like this. And then there was one surprise bonus tool that we found here, which was that in examining the source code for the rootkit, the original rootkit that we found, and the backdoor that accompanied with it, we found almost identical overlap with the, the build environment and some of the source code for what was at the time, and I think may, may remain, the largest Linux DDoS botnet discovered DDoS distributed denial of service attack. So this is a botnet that was discovered a while ago, I think in 2014 or 2015, which had gone sort of unattributed here. We link it up to this splinter cell of we calling it of threat actors. There are five APT groups who are sharing these tools and the infrastructure on which they run in order to engage in espionage. That's what's new. And as I said, if you go and read this report, you can read about all of that. Yeah, you can read about that in greater detail. I want to remind everybody the report is available at blackberry.com slash rats. And also make sure that uh, you're checking us out, uh, whether it's your, your social platform of choice, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Uh, there's going to be information out there about this report. Also some other great stuff. Uh, you know, a lot of good technical things that we've got going on. Sarah, question for you. As an engineer, someone who is out in the field, when you see these types of things, how deep in the stack rank of things that you or your team would go into an environment do you think to look for something like this? Is this one of the reasons why this has been successful for so long is that it is so subtle and hard to find and, and not what you would initially think to look for? I think there's probably two elements here. One, as a security person, your first thought isn't Linux, but two, when you're working with Linux and Unix admins as a security advisor, there's this sort of general agreement that Linux is okay the way it is, and they don't really want your tools there necessarily. Now, that is evolving some, but I don't think that the general perception has been that this is a real threat. As Kevin said, there are known variants of Linux malware out there, but it really just is not priority one or two or three. 
it's not surprising that this has gone on for this long undetected, but there's another issue here, and this is that this is kind of a hard problem to solve. So Kevin was talking about these being custom compiled for the individual systems. Getting software to work on Linux generally has historically been challenging, and it's the last thing to address, I think, when it comes to security and software support. It's like Mac, right? If you've got a Mac, you're safe. You don't need any type of yeah. AV or malware right. protection. Who attacks Mac? <laughs> yeah, and so that, that's a good point because we came to the conclusion that the targeting of Linux here was done for strategic purposes for some of the reasons that you're talking about. Linux is a small part of the marketplace out there in terms of operating system coverage, but it's a very, very important one. I think in the report we say like it's the, the least user-friendly and yet most critically important operating system out there. I do love that bit. It, it's the most awful to actually put your fingers on, but without it, you're not gonna be able to put your fingers on any of this stuff. So Kevin, dig into that a little bit. As far as the report, you know, taking a look at Linux, why it's so relevant, maybe more so to attackers than it is to the users, but at the same time, I mean, it, it's it's virtually everywhere. Yeah. We just don't well, know. What you're, yeah, what you're seeing on this, that's exactly right. What you're seeing up here, this slide is showing you the some of the advantages to Linux for users. And those things you'll see when we've sort of hit these on the next slide turn into exactly the same kind of advantages for attackers. So the same things that attract Linux for your systems administrator also attracted these APT groups. So another, first of all, it's everywhere, right? Linux is used in the enterprise typically in three main ways, right? One, to run web servers. Secondly, to run database servers. And third, to run what they call jump servers or proxy servers that sort of segment your internal traffic from your external traffic. And the number of organizations that are running Linux or using a cloud provider to run Linux to do one of those three things is very, very large, right? Um, just quoting Linux organization itself, you know, it's like three quarters of all web servers out there and, and of major cloud service providers. It run, Linux runs all the stock exchanges. Right, Linux runs all the big e-commerce e giants. You're, you're interacting with Linux every day, you just don't realize it. It's widespread usage and deployment was, is an attractive thing. It's also, Linux has turned to, as Sarah pointed out very astutely, right, because it's assumed to be secure, because it's an open source thing. It's sort of the Wikipedia of operating systems. It's crowd contributed to, and therefore anybody, anytime anybody sees a a security vulnerability or a flaw, they fix it. But because it's assumed to be more secure, it's often left alone and ignored by the security community for a you know, large percentage of the time. And Linux servers are generally thought of and favored by sysadmins because you can kind of set it and forget it. It's going to be on, right? Your company's web server is going to have your web page available 24-7, the all-night diner. It's going to be open all the time. And as a result, it makes itself an attractive target as a beachhead for maintaining persistence inside a network for an APT group. Given that Linux so, is, is such a foundational part of things, it's not, it's not the sexy part of the body, but it's the, the skeleton, the bones, for lack of a better word. In your research and the, you know, the people that you work with, do you get a feeling that there is going to be more Linux attacks either because there's going to be more or we're going to discover more? I think there's probably a fair amount of it out there. As I referenced earlier, these APT groups, which we assess to be acting within the interest of the Chinese government, are not the first nor the last to be targeting Linux. The Russians have also done that. Some other groups have done it as well, but it's hard to find, right? As a result, you don't see a lot about it written publicly in research. You know, as you'll see in the next slide, it lends itself very easily to you can see the benefits for the attack groups when they hit them, right? So if you're hitting a web server, if you compromise that web server, well, that web server is dealing with a lot of network traffic, which makes it very easy to hide the exfiltration of your sensitive IP. If you're hitting a, if you find a, a Linux database server, whether it's segmented from your the rest of your network or not, and we found evidence of successful attacks on both, right? Uh, you have a greater chance of hitting the payload right there because people often use these Linux database servers to store their, their passwords, right? Or to store their intellectual property crown jewels. So hitting that makes it, you don't have to root around and move laterally through a network or spend a lot of time as an attacker looking for what you've come for. 
you can kind of go straight to the source. Same thing, if you hit that jump box Linux server that is segmenting, that is that is acting basically as a firewall between your internal traffic and your, and your external traffic, erasing a layer of protection that everybody relies upon. The fact that it's open source plays the attacker advantage too because they can design malware that is more complicated and make sure that it works and they don't have to, there's not so much guesswork involved as there is when you're writing malware for Windows or Mac, which are closed source. And the fact that it's not user friendly and are left to specialists in your rack room, you know, your systems administration team, your IT team, mean that there are fewer people that are actually gonna be looking at this and fewer people who are gonna be thinking about these problems, right? Same goes for the security community that is selling products to these folks, right? They're more concerned about the desktop users, you know, in your office, the people sitting in the cubicles and especially in the corner office, not the rack room. So that plays to the advantage here of these guys. Sarah, in your career, you have been involved with a lot of customer facing stuff, but you've also worked with threat researchers. I mean, you've really, you, you have a 360 degree holistic view of the industry. Yes, I just put those two things back to back. What we had said earlier about how Linux is largely ignored by EDR or EPP products. In your experience, any idea of why that would be? Is there just so much other stuff going on, whether it's attacking Windows or Macs or other operating systems, that the assumption of Linux being more secure, it's probably going to be okay and there's so much other crap that you need to do? Definitely part of it. We could speculate that some of this is profit-driven. If you look at where the low-hanging fruit is in terms of sales, it's your endpoint. So we start with Windows, right? That's the one that's most publicly compromised, and there's lots and lots of customers out there, so you start there. Mac is the next one that you jump to. And so Linux just kind of lasts just from a, a sales progression. But then if you also look at where security expertise is, who has that security expertise, the, the people that are making their decisions and looking at the threat models, there's just less overlap with people having that Linux, Unix experience in security, just because less people in general have that experience in the industry, I think. How rare a bird is the Linux Unix security expert? I'm not looking for I numbers there, but I mean, just it's, it's, <laughs> you, you swim in these waters more than most. So, yeah. you know, if you've got a room of 20 people, how many of them are going to raise their hand? We say, hey, who really knows how to secure Linux or Unix? Yeah, I mean, I'm married to one. So I think that kind of um, <laughs> my perspective is maybe slightly skewed, but it isn't often. I worked in s several internal security teams over my career's experience and there were definitely unix people and linux people and there were security people but it's rare they exist and you know for those of you that are on this call listening or that say oh i know one good <laughs> talk to them <laughs> ask them to read this report well and that's the you know the, the big push for stem right now i mean right we're all at home so if you're going to read a book why not read something about securing linux it's not just Linux, though, that the, um, that the report goes into. And again, I want to stress the fact that what we're doing is talking about the report. We're not really looking to, to do a deep dive summary of this. Uh, make sure you get out to blackberry.com slash rats, and you can download the full thing. It, it's, uh, it's pretty in-depth and intensive as far as the examination of what's going on. Kevin, where does mobility yeah. come into this? Well, it's another platform kind of like Linux that gets overlooked in a lot of the security research that, you know, the security community that we engage in. We see specialists in the mobile space that often write about mobile attacks as a niche thing, right? As something that uh, APT groups and other attack groups are targeting. Having been in the mobile space for as long as, as we have at BlackBerry, you know, we sort of are looking at this more comprehensively and are noticing in ways that some of our colleagues in the community are, are not really acknowledging that APT groups are attacking multiple platforms simultaneously and particularly ones that are overlooked. So mobile is another, is another and perhaps more important platform that has been under attack successfully by groups like these for a long period of time and yet the number and the quality and the robustness of the security solutions that are available for mobile are relatively lacking in comparison. So we don't go into great detail in this report about the mobile facet of this, but we wanted to carry that theme of if you're looking at these five APT groups, 
and we notice them attacking Linux, we always check to see if they're attacking the other platforms too and write about that as well. And here we did find that. So the report details two new backdoors for Android. One of them is sort of just more of an academic oddity because it was when we when we tore it apart, we noticed that it was actually sort of like a test module. But what was interesting about it, and this is sort of uh, the second, the botnet was the first intriguing connection we made. The second intriguing little uh, oddity that came up in this research was in tearing apart this Android backdoor, this Android rat, we found that it it had remarkable code similarity with a commercially available, legitimate, like pen testing tool called Netwire that's very popular that you can go and buy today. And ordinarily that wouldn't necessarily bother us, right? Because APT groups often reuse publicly available hacking tools or commercially available hacking tools, variety of reasons. That's a trend we've been watching for a while. But what was different about this one is that the APT version of Android Rat predated the Netwire version by two years. So I don't wanna go down that road of speculating as to how that could be. I just sort of flag it as an interesting bit of brain candy to think about or enjoy. The second rat we examined in this report, which is new and, and had gone undiscovered for a while, is one that's actually being used in attacking an enterprise. And of the five APT groups, and we'll get to that, what, who they are in a minute, it was favored by one that we track internally as Casper, but which Microsoft calls Lead. This is another APT group that is generally understood to be acting within the interest of the Chinese government that targets the defense sector, typically. In this case, like many mobile pieces of mobile malware, it poses as a fake app. And in this case, it was a fake like Android flash update. Actually, Sophos, you know, did quite a bit of good work, I think, in describing a campaign in which this was used. We've just sort of like connected dots here in this report, so you can read about it. The point here is that it has gone overlooked for the most part. When you're doing incident response or you're thinking about your defense posture, a lot of people don't think about the mobile phones that are coming in and out of their environment. And so we hope that pointing out that there is malware in play in these same attacks on these same targets simultaneously will get people to think about that more. How much is the Google Play Store come into play. God, yeah, I just walked right into that one. But uh, you talk about being able to hide this in apps and, and things, Android compared yeah. to iOS. Like how big of a difference is that in allowing this type of malware into a network? It's a persistent problem that I think everybody has been aware of for some time. And it, you know, it's just one, it's like whack-a-mole. It's one of those things where you find malicious apps in these stores periodically and you stamp it out and it comes back. As you'll see in the Why It Matters portion of this report, Android is like Linux, right? It's built on open source, <laughs> open source platform in part. So that lends itself perhaps a little bit more to, you see more Android malware than you do iOS malware because you see more Android phones than there are Apple phones out there, right? Android is like some, some rather large percentage of the market worldwide, right? like 80%, something like that. So you typically see more Android stuff. But let's let's talk about why this stuff matters. You know, we, you know definitely it's new, but what is it that, that is catching your attention and why we are looking at this type of thing? Well, I think I think we did that, right? As the next slide will show you, this is another overlooked overlooked platform that people just don't think of as commonly as they think of Windows malware. Android is another op open architecture kind of platform that makes it easier to write malware that's going to work for it. You see, it's just a shameless plug. I know it's not shameless plug time yet, Matt. No, that it, is coming, right? It's but always shameless if, plug time. I'd like to make my shameless plug here, if I may, and point you to the last bit of research I worked on, which, was, uh, which pre precedes this one, which is about, it's sort of a survey piece that discusses how APT groups acting in the interest of various state governments have been using mobile malware in combination with uh, sort of the more traditional malware attacks for a long time and in ways that we've only seen real glimpses of here and there. No, that, that's fair. Interesting question from Arif, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, I apologize if not. 
the organizations that you were looking at for this type of research, do these tend to be really large enterprises or does it run across the board? Let's go through Windows and then we're, we are going to talk about the target set later on. So please stay tuned for that. I promise that question will be acknowledged. Yeah, coming up next. So yeah, speaking of large installations, can't talk about any of this stuff without talking about Windows. So what is new? What is it that uh, your team in, in the research that you discovered? Well, we actually found something really old, right? Which were a couple of uh, back doors that everybody in the security community has known about for a long time. I'm talking about rats like Ghost Rat, which has been around for 20 years, ZX Shell, which has been around for 13 years. So these are things that should be every, on everybody's naughty list, right? And should be easily stopped. But they were still evading the majority of AVs when we found these new variants because they were using droppers that used a couple of tricks. Well, three in particular that made them easy to sort of get by AV. One was the use of a packer. A packer is something that changes the, a malware binary in some way right? So that it changes the hash value for that piece of malware and therefore changes the signature that most AV, most AV software is using to match up to see what's good and what's bad. So that was one. And it used the packer that we hadn't seen before. Most packers are sort of well known. We didn't know which one this was, but we did write some YAR rules so that you could go out and look for more of it. And we were able to break it open nevertheless and figure out what it does. The other two tricks are probably more interesting to talk about, and, and I'm sure Sarah would, will be able to sort of eliminate that a little bit more, but they were using stolen code signing certificates. These groups, as we'll discuss in the attacker target section of this webinar, were all famous for stealing code signing certificates from video game companies. In this case, they shifted to stealing code signing certificates from adware companies the malware looked like adware, even though it wasn't. And it was traveling, as was actually, honestly, I should have mentioned this earlier, in both the Linux section and the Android section, over legitimate cloud service provider infrastructure. Not, in, not exclusively, but to a significant degree. The infrastructure that was used to host all this malware and manage all the exfiltration and all that kind of stuff was coming over traffic that your network defenders would recognize as legitimate, right? As belonging to any one of the number, the large cloud service providers whose names I don't have to mention that you all probably know. So Sarah, to that point, when you are either talking to a potential client or a user, just diagnosing the issues in their network, does it occur to you? And this, that's a terrible way to ask a question. I'm not putting you on the spot, but like, do you want to look for 13 year old stuff? Or is the assumption that, you know, we cured that symptom and we are more focused on the new things that are currently rampaging across the world? Well, there's a couple interesting things there. As Kevin was talking about that signature based technology has limitations and performance. So generally, you look for what's an emerging threat right now, and you optimize to have protections on the endpoint against what's a threat right now. But what we've seen over and over again is malware campaigns that do have old malware. This one's particularly old, but there's a number of threats that have been out for three plus years that we're still seeing out in the wild. So I don't think that's a safe assumption, though. It does seem like a lot of the industry has kind of taken that tack. The AdWare thing is more interesting to me because that's preying on a preconceived notion of security admins. So we know that security tools are looking at certificates as part of what can validate whether binary or executable is malicious or benign. The assumption that something that was signed is okay has kind of gone out the window now. You have to look at what signed it. We've stopped just assuming that because it's code signed, it's safe. But knowing that we see these adware certificates all the time and admins just kind of saying, yeah, it's, it's adware. We see these on installers and, and freeware shareware tools all the time. And so they're just kind of dismissive and they just prey on that alert fatigue of administrators. So I think that one's interest, more interesting. It's, it really is capitalizing on knowing how security admins operate right now, which just shows how sophisticated this or these attack groups are. So this is a little bit outside the scope of the report. Is there just enough of you? 
I mean, I know the the size of the team that you work with and the large the larger BlackBerry team, and then just the rest of the industry. But I mean, you're you're looking at brand new stuff, three years old. Some of these in here, we're talking about Ghost Rat is twenty years old. And is there just enough personnel to do adequate analysis and prevention of these types of attacks? Or is that another episode um, for another time? Yeah, I mean, the personnel shortcomings of uh, insecurity. I mean, we have a negative unemployment rate, uh, even right now, still plenty of opportunity out there. It's definitely a problem. This is why we try to optimize our security for common cases and try to minimize the amount that we need to have our security experts look at because there's just too much for them to look at. But maybe this is something that has been overlooked historically and that we need to go back and take a closer look at. So it's as much hours in the day as it is the bad guys have come up with just the most intense, amazing things ever. No, none of this stuff maybe is that amazing. It's just having enough people and enough time to go through it. Thus ends the editorial section of today's webinar. Kevin, the bad guys, I think the moment you've been itching for a while. Tell us about the attackers. Well, actually, that's an interesting question, Matt, because the attack group that is responsible is known within the security community as WinNTI. But WinNTI, as a reference point for an attack group, has actually become really confusing within the security community. And that's because different people use it to describe and mean different things. WinNTI was originally a name given to a piece of malware by Symantec in 2011. And then in 2013, Kaspersky did a great, a, a bit of sort of groundbreaking in a report called More Than Just a Game, where they identified a WinNTI attack group. It's where we sort of got the idea initially that WinNTI was initially interested in video game companies and that they had sort of broken their teeth on the idea of stealing money within games for criminal purposes, but that they were then taking code signing certificates from those game companies as they left and then using them to turn around and hit a bunch of targets that had nothing to do with crime and nothing to do with video games, right? That were within the strategic interest of the Chinese, which led folks to them and others to assess that these groups were acting within the interest of the Chinese government. Okay. Later on, other groups called it sort of an, an umbrella because then so many different APT groups that were identified by different companies were being called different things and people were sort of linking them to WinNTI in all sorts of ways, both legitimate and I, in my opinion, not so, so much. And what we describe it here is a sort of more of an approach, an approach to sort of corralling groups of what we assess to be probably contractors to hit a bunch of different targets, but who all have certain things in common. So in threat intelligence, when you're talking about attribution and you're talking about these attack groups, right, everybody has a different view of the elephant. And we may be describing the same elephant, but using different words to, to do so. For instance, FireEye, their latest APT group is 41. That's a group that we associate with WinNTI, but they don't use that term, okay, for various reasons. So if you're looking at different parts of the elephant, how do you know you got the elephant right? Well, it depends on how much of it you can see and how long you've been looking at it. And so these are all groups that we have been looking at for a long time. We had a fair amount of malware. As I said, we had the full stack of the Linux malware. So we were able to sort of draw some conclusions about who's, who's involved here so with a high degree of confidence. Instead of talking about when NTI is just one big blob, here we actually break it into different groups that have been written about and have called different things by different security companies who are actually in play here. So you have the original WinNTI group as described by Kaspersky, although I doubt very much that it's actually the same people <laughs> with hands on keyboards after all these years. We have a group called PassCV. So it was a Symantec. Yeah, acquired, acquired by Symantec. That's right. And they're right, their write-ups are actually kind of hard to find, but we wrote about them at Silence. Another group called Bronze Union, which is also called Emissary Panda by the CrowdStrike folks and APT27 by the FireEye folks a group that targets government and defense a lot. Lead, I already mentioned earlier, or Casper is another defense-focused group. Lead is the Microsoft way of calling things. They use elements, like periodic table elements in their naming convention. And then there's a fifth group, which we I put in parentheses there, called WinLinux Splinter. 
which is actually just an emerging group. And, and we, we just include it in this report because its activity set is different. It's using different command and control infrastructure to some extent and different registration uh, credentials for that stuff. And so it's just something that we're watching and tracking. And it may end up folding into something else or it may not. So what do they all have in common very quickly? Again, th they both engage in crime as well as espionage, right? That is not criminally motivated. That's something in common. And they all attack video game companies. Two, notable here, why do we care about all this kind of stuff? To some extent, it's because they're sharing tools and infrastructure. So typically, APT groups are defined as separate because they're using different tools and inf different infrastructure. And in this case, we saw that some of the, that infrastructure was different, but that there was significant overlap in what they were doing. Right, which suggests a, a number of different possibilities as to why that is. But it's important for network defenders because if you're building your risk model based on expecting to see tools or infrastructure coming from one group that you think is targeting you, you shouldn't rule out the fact that there may be other groups that are also sharing that same, that same TTP to attack you. And the other thing is these groups are also known for hitting a huge variety, a huge variety of targets, right? It's not just one thing. Their lens is focused both inward <laughs> at, at political groups within China, as well as externally at Western and mostly Western uh, enterprises and governments. To that yeah. point, uh, Joseph's got a question, and you tell me if this is third rail or if this goes a little deeper in the report. Again, you get the report at yeah. blackberry.com slash rats. Are there indicators that you found in your research that, that point you specifically toward China? I mean, are these kind of well-trod paths that we go down or is a couple of things that jumped out and said we need to be looking in this direction these are well-trod paths so these are groups from looking at their target set and looking about what others in this security community have written about these folks and verifying those results lead you in that direction there are there are some more sort of specific breadcrumbs in this case that i you know i'd lead you to go read about in the report i don't i think it's sort of too much to get into here regarding like what governments have done and indictments recently that have shed light on some of this stuff but for the most part, just our experience, right, in looking at these groups for a long period of time and understanding what it is that they're doing, and then engaging in structured analytical techniques to try to rule out other alternative competing hypotheses, things like that. So these are exercises like analytical exercises that we engage in to try to say, okay, they're using this malware, this infrastructure against these targets, stand to benefit from that, right? And why is it that you know you're attacking a video game one minute and attacking a pharmaceutical company the next minute who does that benefit right and yeah. so you go through all these things and then you kind of rule things out and then you make an assessment but again it's an assessment we are not a government we don't have spies on the ground and signals intelligence and all the other tools that governments have available to them to make those super specific claims of attribution it's not our job also it doesn't help most network defenders to plug the hole that they've got in their environment to know exactly who it is. I think it's enough to attribute this to the level of a threat actor or a threat group and to understand that they are around for a long period of time, that they think in these ways, that they target these kinds of platforms because it helps you react and respond. And we talk about that after this, but anyway, yeah. You hit me with a stick. I don't need to know where the stick came from. I need to know how to fix my bruise. I, that's a little more important. Uh, and that question was Jonathan, not Joseph. So shout out to Jonathan. Sorry for getting that wrong. Is it fair to say that some of these smaller crimes, the petty crimes, as it were, are done to camouflage the fact that there are potentially huge political, social activities going on underneath them that is the, the larger point? Well, it's, it's more evidence to the fact that I think these, these are contractors. I think these are folks that are swinging both ways, that are doing some things for their own benefit, right? And they're doing other things for other people's benefit. Well, let's take so, a look at, at who they are hitting. You've mentioned that it, it's a wide range of things. Well, and we've yeah, had some, so in, the so, obvious question always about attribution, we've got a call labeled Made in China 2025, you know, the, the sectors they're going after. So very brief. We assess that a group is acting in the interest of the Chinese government, right? Whether or not they're connected to them or not, that it stands to reason to ask yourself, well, what is the Chinese government interested in? Because that helps you determine what your targets are. And the Chinese government tells you every 10 years what their strategic interests are. So that's sort of the widest net, right? 
that's sort of the most obvious place to start to say, am I within the target set of these groups that we're talking about in this report? Well, are you in one of these verticals? Would be a good place to start. Drawing into the circle in the, in the bullseye, I would then say, are you a group that is within the historical target set of these specific five APT groups? That's a smaller group of verticals, and some of them are different, actually. That would be of concern. Of more concern would be, are you a past victim of one of these groups? That would be a good place to go or to start thinking about or be concerned about this report and what's in it if you have been previously attacked by WinNTI. Since we know what kinds of operating systems they're running or they're targeting, if you're running one of those, then you might want to pay attention because you could be within their target set. Right. So are you running one of the we found four different Linux distributions targeted? That's Red Hat Enterprise and CentOS and then Debian and Ubuntu. But there are likely others. There are likely others. This is just the ones we found. So are you running Linux in your environment to do any of those three things that we talked about earlier? And are you running legacy kernel versions? Because it's legacy kernel versions that the malware that we found was attacking. You know, you should think sort of more strategically about whether or not you are an attractive target to a group that has espionage for the purposes of, of stealing intellectual property as its mission. Well, and Arif is definitely bringing it today. He's had uh, several good questions in there. And this one I like. I'm not sure exactly how to answer this, but because you're two of the smartest people I know, I'm going to ask it anyway. Can you offer a real case example of value that has been realized or losses that have been prevented from your efforts. And I'm going to take a little bit of that because one thing I think it, it's, it's like you can't prove a negative. It's hard to know what didn't happen because of this type of research, but I feel like that's the perfect segue into the take home. After you've gone through the report, hopefully listened to us, spoke with engineering, that sort of thing. What is it now that you are armed with this information? Again, it's at blackberry.com slash rats. What do you learn? What can you do now that you are armed with this knowledge? That the important takeaway from this report, without us trying to dig into who specifically is being targeted, although I think we have a pretty good idea when we look at IP data and who runs Linux, which is virtually everybody that would have interesting IP data. What should we be doing as security people? Whether we're doing assessments across environments, Definitely mobile security. It's important, I think, with the pieces in Android. So having the ability to recognize Android malware, also having the ability to sandbox critical data when you're ac accessing it from your mobile devices because you are at risk on your mobile device. We just take for granted that we can get into our email and our documents and everything from our phones. But that's not all we need to worry about. Don't assume that old threats are gone. Don't assume that just because something has a legit certificate that it's legitimate. As we're looking at this, this gives us a starting point to look at an APT attack more holistically from the point where it enters the environment where they gain persistence and use your Linux service as a beachhead, but then just looking at the threat actors across all of these different platforms. That's my takeaway here. Kevin, your thought? I think that threat intelligence and how it's used is sort of something that is still evolving and is debated within, within the security community. I mean, it does have tactical value, I believe, right? Because why? Because we've identified malware that other people don't seem to know about, and including you. I'm not just talking about other security vendors. I'm including network defenders, right? So, so taking the indicators of compromise that are discussed and included in the appendix in this report and that are available, even, you know, th th there's more that's, that's not been published that's available. If, if you get in touch with us, looking inside your own network to see if you've been compromised. Well, that's the that's value of this report, right? That shows you that this intelligence is, is doing something to help you identify a problem that you may have. Secondly, when you publish these things, the attackers read them too and change their tactics all the time. So using the YAR rules that are provided in here, using the infrastructure indicators of compromise that are here so that you can watch to see where they go next and find more of this is also a value, right? If you are sort of perennially within the bullseye of a group like this or set of groups like this, but your companies just take indicators of compromise and plug it into a SIM and call it a day. Figure, well, that's all I need to do about threat intelligence. They're just ingesting a feed. But I would urge you to consider that 
the strategic value of reports like this that help you, you know, maybe if you're not a, may, maybe not the sysadmin, but help the CISO or someone up the chain at an organization think a little bit more critically about their risk model, right? And about their defensive posture in general. And so here, this report can help you to think more critically about whether or not you're in the target set of these groups. If you've ever had a previous encounter with, with WinNTI or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> or any of these subsidiary groups, right? This is going to be a value to you because it's going to tell you places that you might not have thought to look for a problem. You may have thought and hired somebody to get rid of a WinNTI Windows malware problem, but not had anybody look at your Linux servers or thought about the mobile phones that you hand out in for business to your execs. This report will help you to do that and give you a starting point for where to go look. Same thing with that botnet. If you've been hit with that botnet, the fact that we've made a connection now between that botnet, which was just sort of just floating out there alone, and a bunch of other activity that we can talk about in great granularity gives you a good opportunity to make some findings, right? To, to look for a problem that you may not realize you have had. So there's value there. And then just more broadly, in the security community, we've been talking about one of the recurring themes in, in this report and in other reports that we put out there, speak to the need to check your assumptions, to question your own cognitive bias, as it were, as you're approaching network defense. Are you bored at the thought of Linux? Boring does not mean that it's not sexy and not an un that it's unimportant. It means if they bore you to death, that's exactly what they were hoping for on the attacker side because they're, they're just going to work away unimpeded. Adware, again, like well, how do you treat adware within your environment? Are you just going to dismiss it as something potentially unwanted or something to look at last? Well, it could be a foothold for an APT group. So you have to think more critically about that attitude. Same thing. How do you treat network traffic to and from cloud service providers? So looking at multiple platforms, looking backwards and not just forwards, looking for objective blending. What I mean by that is looking for signs of criminal activity as well as, as more serious sort of government-backed espionage are within your interest because it helps you ultimately to think about your network defense posture differently. So you can do the blocking and tackling, you can hit the strategic risk modeling ideas, and then you can think more critically if you're engaged in network defense about how it is you do your job. So one last thing, we're coming up on the hour, but this is, it's something that, that we talked a little bit getting ready for this. That question, board, that's their hope. And this is for both of you. Uh, again, Sarah, your perspective being out in the field, Kevin, your perspective doing this type of deep dive research. Is bland the new interesting? Like, are they really working hard to be the type of face you forget while you're looking at it? I would say definitely. What, one thing we kind of glossed over is how they get onto those Linux servers in the first place, which is most likely brute force attack. So they're just trying a million passwords until they get in. The fact that that still works just shows that eh, SSH passwords and SSH security is boring too. I think they're playing on that and we can't let the boredom dictate their success. We, we have to take interest in it. We have to take notice of it. It's why they're still accounting. It may not be exciting, but you absolutely need it and you need to do it. So, yep. Yeah. Kevin, you mentioned your, my favorite part of the show, shameless plugs. I know that you guys are both security professionals, so probably very little information about there. Anything uh, that you guys want to give a shout out to? Read the report. <laughs> we spent a lot of time writing it. It'd be nice if people read it. That's all. That's all I'm going to plug. All right. Well said. Sarah, do you remember your Twitter handle? Lofgren and Silence, you, at Lofgren and Silence. You can follow me on Twitter. Connect with me on LinkedIn. I always like having more friends on LinkedIn. I also did a podcast, was it two weeks ago, with my husband. So if you want to hear about security and quarantine with, with children working from home right now, feel free to give a listen. What happens when two elite security professionals are in quarantine with kids? Oh, and also a livestock farm. So yeah, check that out. And I thank you for the shameless plug for me on that one. We've been telling you about it. Check it out, blackberry.com slash rats. The overall website obviously is blackberry.com. 
also Twitter at BlackBerry and Facebook and LinkedIn. Also, check out the Insecurity Podcast. You can find that at threadvector.silence.com. There is additional content with a lot more of the threat research work that we have done. There's some great video content in there as well as a lot of our technical writing. Kevin's got some stuff in there. Sarah has some stuff in there. And as she said, she uh, did a, a really interesting and fun episode of the podcast with her husband, who is also an elite engineer in the world of cybersecurity. So it's worth checking out. My name is Matt Stevenson. You can find me at PacMad73 on Twitter. I will try to get you connected with anybody and everybody who can help answer questions and look for the podcast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all that good stuff. We got lots more of this good webinar content coming. So make sure you check us out and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks everybody for coming.